Hey, what's up? It's me, Brianka J, and I'm back. Thank you for coming back to my little what is the corner of the internet? My little corner of the internet, guys. Um, today I wanted to just honor this dress. I went to Mexico recently and got some dinner work done. I got to walk around Progreso, and I found this dress at this merchant, and I just loved it so much. Even though I didn't really have anywhere to go in it. But to celebrate my trip to Mexico, to celebrate this dress, I thought we would come back and give another story from Sanchez Cisneros called Never Marry a Mexican. This story is oh so juicy and oh so good, guys. I just have to share it. Before we get started, though, I do want to invite you to like, comment, and subscribe. If you love hearing short stories or you love books in general, go ahead, subscribe. Let the people know that we gang, 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 gang in this joint. And go ahead, get comfortable, relax. We're about to get into the story. Before we do that, though, I want to invite you to my description box. Check out all I have to offer, including how to connect with me on other social platforms like Instagram and Twitter. Also, if you are in need of a small business website, that is what I do, guys. I live for it. And I want to invite you to um, get a website from me. Um, partner with me, collaborate with me. For your business needs in 2022 when it comes to establishing an online presence so all of that's in the description box take your time with it but right now grab me some tea grab some coffee get comfy let's hear from Sanja Cisneros with never marry a Mexican Never marry a Mexican, my mom said once and always. She said this because of my father. She said this though she was Mexican too, but she was born here in the U.S. And he was born there. And it's not the same, you know. I'll never marry, not any man. I've known men too intimately. I've witnessed their infidelities and I've helped them to it, unzipped and unhooked and agreed to clandestine maneuvers. I've been an accomplice of committed premeditated crimes. I'm guilty of having called delivered pain to other women. I'm vindictive and cruel. And I'm capable of anything. I admit, there was a time when all I wanted was to belong to a man. To wear that gold band on my left hand and be worn on his arm like an expensive jewel, brilliant in the light of day. Not the sneaking around I did in different bars that all looked the same. Red carpets with a black grillwork design, flocked wallpaper, wooden wagon wheel light fixtures with hurricane lampshades, a sick amber color like the drinking glasses you get from a free at the gas station. Dark bars, dark restaurants then. And if not, my apartment with his toothbrush firmly planted in the toothbrush holder like a flag on the North Pole. The bed so big because he never stayed the whole night. Of course not. Borrow. That's how I've had my men. Just the cream skimmed off the top. Just the sweetest part of the fruit. Without the bitter skin that daily living with the spouse can rend. They've come to me when they've wanted the sweet meat then. So no, I've never married and never will. Not because I couldn't, but because I'm too romantic for marriage. Marriage has failed me. You could say, not a man exists who hasn't disappointed me whom I could trust to love the way I've loved. It's because I love too much in marriage, believe too much in marriage that I don't. Better to not marry than live a lie. Mexican men, forget it. For a long time, the men clearing off the tables or chopping meat behind the butcher counter or driving the bus I rode to school every day, those weren't men, not men I considered as potential lovers. Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Chilean, Colombian, Panamanian, Salvadoran, Bolivian, Honduran, Argentine, Dominican, Venezuelan, Guatemalan, Ecuadorian, Nicaraguan, Peruvian, Costa Rican, Paraguayan, Uruguayan. I don't care. I never saw them. My mother did this to me. I guess she did it to spare me as the men of the pain she went through. 
having married a Mexican man at 17, having had put up with all the grief of a Mexican family put on a girl because she was from El Otro Lado, the other side, and my father had married down by marrying her. If he had married a white woman from El Otro Lado, that would have been different. That would have been marrying up, even if the white girl was poor. But what could be more ridiculous than a Mexican girl who couldn't even speak Spanish, who didn't know enough to set a separate plate for each course at dinner, nor how to fold boat cloth napkins, nor how to set the silverware? In my mom's house, the plates were always stacked in the center of the table. The knives, the forks, and spoons standing in a jar, help yourself. All the dishes chipped or cracked and nothing matched and no tablecloths ever and newspapers set on the table whenever my grandpa sliced watermelons and how embarrassed she would be when her boyfriend, my father, would come over the, and there were newspapers all over the kitchen floor and table and my grandpa, a big hardworking Mexican man, saying, come, come and eat and slicing a big wedge of those dark green watermelons, a big slice. He wasn't stingy with food. Never, even during the depression. Come, come and eat. To whoever came knocking on the back door. Hobo sitting at the dinner table and they never went without. Flour and rice by the barrel, by the sack. Potatoes, big bags of pinto beans and watermelons. Bought three or four at a time. Rolled under his bed and brought out when you least expect it. My grandma or my grandpa had survived three wars. One Mexican, two American, and he knew what living without meant. He knew. My father, on the other hand, did not. True, when he first came to this country, he had worked shelling clams, washing dishes, planting hedges, sat on the back of the bus in Little Rock and had the bus driver shout, You sit up here. And my father had shrugged sheepishly and said, No speak English. But he was so econ no economic refugee. No immigrant fleeing a war. My father wait, ran away from home because he was afraid of faith. And his father, after his first year grades at the university, proved he spent more time fooling around than studying. He left behind a house in Mexico City that was neither poor nor rich, but thought itself better than both. A boy who would get off a bus when he saw a girl he knew would bo board if he didn't have the money to pay for her fare. That was the world my father left behind. I imagine my father and his Fanfaron clothes, because that's what he was, a fanfaron. That's what my father thought the moment she turned around to the voice that was asking her to dance. A big show-off, she said years later. Nothing but a big show-off. But she never said why she married him. My father in his shark blue suits with the starch handkerchief in the breast pocket, his felt fedora, his tweed top coat, the big shoulders and heavy British wing tips, and the pinhole design on the heels and toe. Clothes that cost a lot. Expensive. That's what my father's things said. Qualidad. Quality. <clears throat> my father must have found the U.S. Mexicans very strange. So foreign from what he knew at home in Mexico City, where, he, where the servant served watermelon on a plate with silverware and a cloth napkin, or mangoes with their own special prongs. Not like this. Eating with your legs wide open in the yard or in the kitchen hunked over a newspaper. Come, come and eat. No, never like this. How I make my living depends. Sometimes I work as a translator. Sometimes I get paid by the word. And sometimes by the hour. Depending on the job. I do this in the day and at night I paint. I do anything in the day just so I can keep on painting. I work as a substitute teacher, too, for the San Antonio Independent School District. And that's worse than translating those travel brochures with their tiny print, believe me. I can't stand kids, not any age, but it pays the rent. Anyway, you look at it. What I do to make a living is a form of prostitution, people say. A painter? How nice. And want to invite me to their parties, have me decorate the lawn like an exotic orchid for hire. But do they by art? I'm amphibious. I'm a person who doesn't belong to any class. The rich like to have me around because they envy my creativity. They know they can't buy that. The poor don't mind if I live in their neighborhood because they know I'm poor like they are. Even if my education and the way I dress keeps us world apart. 
I don't belong to any class, not to the poor whose neighborhood I share, not to the rich who come to my exhibitions and buy my work, not to the middle class from which my sister Zemina and I fled. When I was young, when I first left home and rented that apartment with my sister and her kids right after her husband left, I thought it would be glamorous to be an artist. I wanted to be like Frida or Tina. I was ready to suffer with my camera and my paintbrushes in the awful apartment we rented for $150 each because it had high ceilings and those wonderful glass skylights that convinced us we had to have it. Never mind there was no sink in the bathroom and a tub that looked like a sarcophagus and floorboards that didn't meet and a hallway to scare away the dead. But 14 foot ceilings was enough for us to write a check for the deposit right then and there. We thought it all romantic. You know the place, the one on Zazamora, on top of the barbershop with the Casalola prints of the Mexican Revolution? Neon, Bira, Bira Telen, sign around the corner. Two goats knocking their hairs together in all those Mexican bakeries, Las Brisas for huevos, rancheros, and carnitas and barbacoa on Sundays, and fresh fruit, fruit milkshakes, and mango paletas, and more signs in Spanish than English. We thought it was great. Great. The barrio looked cute in the daytime, like Sesame Street. Kids hopscotching on the sidewalk, blessed little boogers. And hardware stores that still sold ostrich feather dusters. And whole family marching out of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church on Sunday. Girls in their swirly, swirly dresses and patent leather shoes. Boys in their dress stacies and, and shiny shirts. But nights, that was nothing like what we knew on the north side. Pistols going off like the wild, wild west. And me and Zemina and the kids huddled in that one bed with the lights off, listening to it all, saying, go to sleep. It's just baby. It's just firecrackers. But we knew better. Zemina would say, Clemencia, we should go home. And I'd say, shit. Because she knew as well as I did there was no home to go to. Not with our mother. Not with that man she married after daddy died. It was like we didn't matter. Like Ma was so busy feeling sorry for herself. I don't know. I'm not like Zemina. I still haven't worked it out after all this time. Even though our mother's dead now. My half brother's living in that house that should have been ours. Me and Zemina's. But that's, how do you say it? Water under the dam? I can never get the sayings right even though I was born in this country. We didn't say shit like that in our house. Once daddy was gone, it was like my mom didn't exist. Like she died too. I used to have a little flinch. Twisted on one of his tiny red legs between the bars of the cage once. Who knows how. The leg just dried up and fell off. My bird lived a long time without it. Just a little red stump of a leg. He was fine, really. My mother's memory is like that. Like if something already dead dried up and fell off. And I stopped missing where she used to be. Like if I never had a mother. And I'm not ashamed, ashamed to say it either. When she married that white man and he and his boys moved into the, my father's house, it was as if she stopped being my mother. Like I never even had one. My always sick and too busy. Worrying about her own life. She would have sold us to the devil if she could. Because I'm married so young, Miha, she'd say. Because your father, he was so much older than me, and I never had a chance to be young, honey. Try to understand. Then I stopped listening. That man she met at work, Owen Lambert, the foreman at the photo finishing plant, who she was seeing even while my father was sick, even then, that's what I can't forgive. When my father was coughing up blood and phlegm in the hospital, half his face frozen and his tongue so fat he couldn't talk, he looked so small with all those tubes and plastic sacks dangling around him. But what I remember most is the smell, like death, was already sitting on his chest. And I remember the doctor scraping the phlegm out of my father's mouth while with the white washcloth and my daddy gagging. And I wanted to yell, stop, you stop that. He's my daddy, goddamn you. Make him live. Daddy, don't. Not yet, not yet, not yet. And how couldn't I hold myself up? I couldn't hold myself up like if they've beaten me or pulled my insides out through my nostrils like if they stuffed me with cinnamon and cloves and I just stood there dry-eyed next to Zemina and my mother. The men in between us because I wouldn't let her stand next to me. Everyone repeating over and over the Ave Marias and Padre Nuestros. The priest sprinkling holy water. Mundo sin fin. Amen. Drew. 
Remember when you used to call me your Molly Nolly? It was a joke. A private game between us because you looked like a Cortez with that beard of yours. My skin dark against yours. Beautiful, you said. You said I was beautiful. And when you said it, Drew, I was. My Molly Nolly. Malinche. My courtesan. You said you and yanked my head back by the braid, calling me that name in between little gulps of breath and the raw kisses you gave, laughing from that black beard of yours. Before daybreak, you be gone, same as always, before I even knew it. And what if I imagined you, only the teeth marks on my belly and nipples proving me wrong. Your skin pale, but your hair blacker than a pirate's. Molly Nolly, you called me, remember? Mi Doradita. I like when you spoke me in my language. I could love myself and think myself worth loving. Your son. Does he know how much I had to do with his birth? I was the one who convinced you to let him be born. Did you tell him while his mother lay on her back laboring his birth, I lay in his mother's bed making love to you? You're nothing without me. I created you from spit and red dust. And I can snuff you between my fingers and thumb if I want to. Blow you to kingdom come. You're just a smudge of paint I chose to birth on canvas. And when I made you over, you were no longer part of her. You were all mine. The landscape of your body taut as a drum. The heart beneath the hide thrumming and thrumming. Not an inch did I give back. I paint and repaint you the way I see fit. Even now, after all these years. Did you know that, little fool? You think I went hobbling along with my life. Whimpering and whining like some twangy country and western when you went back to her. But I've been waiting. Making the world look at you from my eyes. If that's not power... What is? Nights, I light all the candles in the house. The one to La Virgin de Guadalupe. The one to El Nino Fidencio. Don Perito Jaramillo. Santo Nino de Ochoa. Nuestra Sonora de San Juan de los Lagos. And especially Saint Lucia with her beautiful eyes on a plate. Your eyes are beautiful, you said. You said they were the darkest eyes you'd ever seen and kissed each one as if they were capable of miracles. And after you left, I wanted to scoop them out with a spoon, place them on a plate under these blue, blue skies, food for the blackbirds. The boy, your son, the one with the face of that red-headed woman who was your wife. The boy, red freckled like fish food floating on the skin of water. That boy. I've been waiting patient as a spider all these years since I was 19 and he was just an idea hovering in his mother's head. And I'm the one that gave him permission and made it happen, see? Because your father wanted to leave your mother and live with me. Your mother whining for a child, at least that. He kept saying, later, we'll see, later. But all along, it was me he wanted to be with. It was me, he said. I want you to tell you evenings when you come to see me, when you're full of talk about what kind of clothes you're going to buy and what you used to be like when you started high school and what you're like now that you're almost finished and how everyone knows you're at, you as a rocker and your band and your new red guitar that you just got your, because your mother gave you a choice, a guitar or a car, but you don't need a car, do you? Because I drive you everywhere. You could be my son if you weren't so light-skinned. This happened a long time ago, before you were born. When you were a mouth, moth inside your mother's heart i was your father's student yes just like your mind and your father painted and painted me because he said i was his dorita all golden and sunbaked and that's the kind of woman he likes best the ones brown as river sand yes and he took me under his wing and his bed this man this teacher your father i was honored that he done me the favor i was that young all I know is I was sleeping with your father the night you were born, in the same bed you were conceived. I was sleeping with your father and didn't give a damn about that woman, your mother. If she was a brown woman like me, I might have had a hard time living with myself. But since she's not, I don't care. I was there first, always. I've always been there, in the mirror, under his skin, and the blood before you were born. And he's been here in my heart before I even knew him. Understand? He's always been here. Always. Dissolving like hibiscus flower. Exploding like a rope into dust. I don't care what's right anymore. I don't care about his wife. She's not my sister. 
And it's not the last time I've slept with a man the night his wife is birthing a baby. Why do I do that, I wonder? Sleep with a man when his wife is giving life. Being suckled by a thing with his eyes still shut. Why do that? It's always given me a bit of crazy joy to be able to kill those women like that without their knowing it. To know I've had their husbands when they were anchored in blue hospital rooms. Their guts yanked inside out. The baby sucking their breasts while their husbands sucked mine. And this while their ass stitches were still hurting. Once, drunk on margaritas, I telephoned your father at four in the morning. Woke the bitch up. Hello, she chirped. I wanted to talk to Drew. Just a moment, she said in her most polite drawing room English. Just a moment, I laughed with, uh, about that for weeks. What a stupid ass to pass the phone over to the lug asleep beside her. Excuse me, honey, it's for you. When Drew mumbled hello, I was laughing so hard I could hardly talk. Drew, that dumb bitch of a wife of yours, I said, and that's all I could manage. That stupid, stupid, stupid. No Mexican woman would react like that. Excuse me, honey? It cracked me up. He's got the same kind of skin, the boy. All the blue veins, pale and clear just like his mama. Skin like roses in December. Pretty boy, little clone, little cell split into you and you and you. Tell me, baby, which part of you is your mother? I tried to imagine her lips, her jaw, her long legs that wrapped themselves around his father who took me to his bed. This happened. I'm asleep or pretend to be. You're watching me. Drew, I feel your weight when you just sit on your corner of the bed, dressed and ready to go. But now you're just watching me sleep. Nothing. Not a word. Not a kiss. Just sitting. You're taking me in, under inspection. What do you think already? I haven't stopped dreaming you. Did you know that? Did you know, Do you think it's strange? I never tell, though. I keep it to myself like I do all the thoughts I think of you after all these years. I don't want you looking at me. I don't want you taking me in while I'm asleep. I'll open my eyes and frighten you away. There. What did I tell you, Drew? What is it? Nothing. I knew you'd say that. Let's not talk. We're no good at it. With you, I'm useless with words, as if somehow I had to learn to speak all over again, as if the words I needed haven't been invented yet. We're cowards. Come back to bed. At least there I feel I have you for a little, for a moment, for a catch of the breath. You let go. You ache and tug. You rip my skin. You're almost not a man without your clothes. How do I explain it? You're such a child in my bed. Nothing but a big boy who needs to be held. I won't let anyone hurt you, my pirate, my slender boy of a man. After all these years. I didn't imagine it, did I? A Genghis, an eye of the storm, for a little. When we forget ourselves, you tugged me. I leapt inside you and split like you and split you like an apple. Open for the other to look and not give back. Something wrenched itself loose. Your body doesn't lie. It's not silent like you. You're nude as a pearl. You've lost your train of smoke. You're tender as rain. If I put you in my mouth, you dissolve like snow. You are ashamed to be so naked. Pull back. But I saw you for what you are. When you opened yourself for me, when you were careless and let yourself through, I caught that catch of the breath. I'm not crazy. When you slept, you tugged me toward you. You sought me in the dark. I didn't sleep. Every cell, every follicle, every nerve alert. Watching you sigh and roll and turn and hug me closer to you. I didn't sleep. I was taking you in and that time, your mother. Only once, years after your father, I stopped seeing each other at an art exhibition. As shown in the photograph of Eugene Agat. Those images, I could look at them for hours. I had taken a group of students with me. It was your father I saw first. In that instant, I felt as if everyone in the room, all the sepia tone photographs, my students, the men in business suits, the high heeled women, the security guards, everyone could see me for what I was. I had to scurry out, leave my kids to another gar gallery. But some things destiny has cut out for you. He called up with us in the Kochek area arm in arm with a red-headed Barbie doll in a fur coat. One of those scary Dallas tights. Hair yanked into a ponytail, big shiny face like the woman behind the cosmetic counter at Neiman's. That's what I remember. She must have been with him all along, only I never, I swear I never saw her until that second. You could tell 
from a slight hesitancy, only slight, because he's too suave to hesitate, that he was nervous. Then he's walking toward me, and I didn't know what to do. Just stood there dazed, like those animals crossing the road at night when the headlights stunned them. And I don't know, but all of a sudden I looked at my shoes and felt ashamed at how old they looked. And he comes up to me, my love, your father. That way of his, that grin that makes me want to beat him, makes me want to make love to him. And he says in the most sincere voice you ever heard, Ah, Clemencia, this is Megan. No introduction could have been meaner. This is Megan, just like that. I grinned like an idiot and held out my paw. Hello, Megan. I smiled too much the way you do when you can't stand someone. Then I got the hell out of there, chattering like a monkey all the ride back with my kids. When I got home, I had to down with a cold washcloth on my forehead and the TV on. All I could hear throbbing under the washcloth in that deep part behind my eyes is, This is Megan. And that's how I fell asleep, with the TV on and every light in the house burning. When I woke up, it was something like 3 in the morning. I shut the lights and TV and went to get some aspirin. And the cats who'd been asleep with me on the couch got up too and followed me into the bathroom as if they knew what, what's what. And then, we, and then they followed me into bed where they weren't allowed. But this time, I just let them, fleas and all. This happened too. I swear I'm not making this up. It's all true. It was the last time I was going to be with your father. We had agreed. All for the best. Surely I could see that, couldn't I? My own good, a good sport, a young girl like me. Hadn't I understood responsibilities? Besides, he could never marry me. You didn't think. Never marry a Mexican. Never marry a Mexican. No, of course not. I see. I see. We had the house to ourselves for a few days. Who knows how? You and your mother had gone somewhere. Was it Christmas? I don't remember. I remember the leaded glass lamp with the milk glass above the dining room table. I made a mental inventory of everything. The Egyptian lotus design and the hinges of the doors. The narrow dark... I made a mental inventory of everything. The Egyptian lotus design on the hinges of the doors. The narrow dark hall where your father and I had made love once. The far four-claw tub where he had washed my hair and rinsed it in a tin bowl. This window, that counter, the bedroom with its light in the morning, incredibly soft, like the light from a polished dime. The house was immaculate, as always. Not a stray hair anywhere. Not a flake of dandruff or a crumpled towel. Even the roses on the dining room table held their breath. A kind of airless cleanliness that always made me want to sneeze. Why was I curious about this woman he lived with? Every time I went to the bathroom, I found myself opening the medicine cabinet, looking at all the things that were hers, her Estee Lauder lipsticks, coral and pinks, of course, and blonde hairpins. A pair of bone-colored sheepskin slippers, as clean as the day she bought them. On the door hook, a white robe with a Made in Italy label. And a silky nightshirt with pearl buttons. I touched the fabrics. Callie Dodd. Quality. I don't know how to explain what I did next. While your father was busy in the kitchen, I went over to where I left my backpack and took out a bag of gummy bears I bought. And while he was hanging pots, I went around the house and left a trail of them in places I was sure she would find them. One in the Lucite makeup organizer, one stuffed inside each bottle of nail polish. I untwisted the expensive lipsticks to their full length and smushed a bear on the top before recapping them. I even put a gummy bear in her di diaphragm case in the very center of that luminescent rubber moon. Why bother? Drew could take the blame, or he could say it was the cleaning woman's Mexican voodoo. I knew that too. It didn't matter. I got a strange satisfaction wandering about the house, leaving them in places only she would look. And just as Drew was shouting, dinner, I saw it on the desk. One of those wooden babushka dolls Drew had brought her from her trip to Russia. I knew he bought one just like it for me. I just did what I did. and capped the doll inside a doll inside a doll until I got to the very center the tiniest baby inside all the others, and this our place with the gummy bear. And then I put the dolls back, just like I found them, one inside the other, inside the other, except for the baby. 
which I put inside my pocket. All through dinner, I kept reaching into the pocket of my jean jacket. When I touched it, it made me feel good. On the way home, on the bridge over the Audio of Guadalupe Street, I stopped the car, switched on the emergency blinkers, got out, and dropped the wooden toy into the muddy creek where wine oats pissed and rats swim. The Barbie doll's toy stewing there in that muck. It gave me a feeling like nothing before and since. Then I drove home and slept like the dead. These mornings, I fix coffee for me, milk for the boy. I think of that woman and I can't see a trace of my lover in this boy, as if she conceived him by immaculate conception. I sleep with this boy, their son, to make the boy love me the way I love his father, to make him want me, hunger, twist in his sleep, as if he swallowed glass. I put him in my mouth, here, a little piece of my cortisol, boy with hard thighs and just a bit of down and a small down ass like his father's, and that back like a valentine. Come here, my carnito. Come to mamita. Here's a bit of toast. I can tell from the way he looks at me. I have him in my power. Come, Sparrow. I have the patience of eternity. Come to mamita. My stupid little bird. I don't move. I don't startle him. I let him nibble. All, all for you. Rub his belly. Stroke him before I snap my teeth. What is it inside me that makes me so crazy at 2 a.m.? I can't blame it on alcohol in my blood when there isn't any. It's something worse, something that poisons the blood and tips me, and then the night swells, and I feel that the whole sky were leaning against my brain. And if I kill someone on a night like this, and if it was me I killed, instead I'd be guilty of getting in line of crossfire, innocent bystander there. Isn't it a shame? I'd be walking with my head full of images and my back to the guilty. Suicide? I couldn't say. I didn't see it. Except it's not me who I want to kill. When the gravity of the planet is just right, it's all tilts and upsets and the visible balance. It's that when it's not from my eyes. That's when I get on with my telephone. Dangerous as a terrorist. There's nothing to do but let it come. So what do you think? Are you convinced? I, now I'm as crazy as a tulip or a taxi, as vagrant as a cloud. Sometimes the sky is so big and I feel so little at night. That's the problem with being cl cloud. The sky is so terribly big. Why is it worse at night? When I have such an urge to communicate and no language with which to form the words, only colors, pictures, and you know what I have to say isn't always pleasant. Oh, love. There. I've gone and done it. What good is it? Good or bad? I've done what I had to do and needed to. And you've answered the phone and startled me away like a bird. And now you're probably swearing under your breath and going back to sleep with that wife beside you, warm, radiating her own heat, alive under the flannel, and down the sm smelling a bit like milk and hand cream. And that smell familiar and dear to you. Oh, human beings pass me on the street. And I want to reach out and strum them as if they were guitars. Sometimes all humanity strikes me as lovely. I just want to reach out and stroke someone and say, there, there. It's all right, honey. There, there, there. That is Sandra Cicineros' uh, Never Marry a Mexican, y'all. I feel love that story. I hope that you found it just as incredibly enjoying and riveting and plot twisting and turning as I have. And if you want more stories like this, then you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, or subscribe on this video to let me know how you feel. Anyway, again, my name is Brianka J. And I want to thank you one more time for coming to my little corner of the internet. And I hope to see you again. I make videos at least three or four times a week. And you're welcome to join us every single time. See you soon.